Food service accounts for about 34% of the food dollar um, and it's also quite often more profitable than retail. So even though the profit margin, the gross profit margin is less in food service, the cost, particularly the marketing costs, are a lot less and therefore the bottom line is often better. Food service consists of two divisions or two, two parts, the commercial which is the cafes, the restaurants, the QSA which is the quick serve and the institution which is the hospitals etc. The institutional um, sector is growing uh, quite rapidly because of aged care and hospital and the ageing of the population, the contracting out of, of, of things. So that's really quite a growth sector. It's growing faster than retail uh, in value terms and so it's, it's a market that uh, people should look at. It's a highly dynamic sector. Um, it's, there's a lot of rationalisation, so you're seeing a lot of very large players like Spotless and those sort of companies, Bidvest or whatever, building up and getting contracts for mining camps, for hospitals, for, for even sporting events, catering or whatever. Um, we're seeing the, the chefless and knifeless kitchen, so because it's so hard to get trained chefs and because they cost so much in a 24-7 operation such as a hospital, it's a lot e easier to bring in a product that's pre-prepared. You literally c cut it open with some scissors, put it in a microwave or an oven or a heating system, pour a sauce over it and serve it. So that's, that's a real growth area. So even though the cost of, of that product is, mu is much higher, food service operators are prepared to pay that because it saves them all that labour and training and all those sorts of things. Coffee's becoming really big. Coffee is part of Australia's DNA. Um, but the other point I want to make is that food service is becoming a place where hero brands are built. So the King Island brand was built in food service before it went to retail. Uh, we're seeing if you go to a restaurant now you'll see that the steak is the Nolan's 200 day grain fed or whatever. So we're seeing brands start to emerge on the on the menus. And, and for example it was how um, the Angus, uh, certified Angus um, launched their brand. So they were trying to get a branded product in, in the retailers for years, couldn't do it. They took at the McDonald's and the, and the hamburger places and now they've got an established brand and they're really <coughs> going places. Now I want to talk about private label which is a highly controversial topic at the moment. Um, but I think private label is really now starting to hurt in Australia. Uh, it struggled for a long time to take off, but now we've got the majors sort of saying that they've got a target of, of trying to get to 30% of, of their sales in private label by 2012. It's probably a hard call, but they've certainly got the intention of ramping up. The private label has been very slow to take off in Australia. Uh, in the early days, it was cheap and cheerful stuff. The value, the quality was all over the place. The, um, the value proposition was all over the place. But supermarkets invest very heavily to get good quality product that's as good as the branded items. They tend to have a good, better, best quality range. You're getting the likes of Aldi, who've got Swiss chocolate that's better than um, better than any of the good brands. And the other thing too is the strong Australian dollar is bringing a lot of imports in too. So we, we, I think we're going to see a lot of growth in private label. The, um, I guess the, one of the, the issues for, um, for, for brand marketers is it's very hard to get into the fresh produce state with a brand. So almost all of the fruit and veg and the meat is all private, is all a uh, store branded product. And it's very hard for people, for, for a marketer to get their brand established because the supermarkets want to differentiate on the basis of the quality of their fruit and vegetables. So that, that's a real problem. The, um, the private label strategy in Australia has shifted, um, so it's, it's really tends to be confined to high, high turnover lines, so it's, it's lines that turn over a lot of stock, they're not going to do it in small and minute lines. It works best in commodities where there's not much difference and there's not a high risk for the consumer. They tend to emulate the market leader, so if the market leader has a red pack then they'll tend to have red colourings in their pack etc. Prominent shelf space, sell below um, the proprietary brand by anything up to 50% um, and generally it, it brings a premium market margin for the retailer. One of the, the problems, when private label first started, food processors loved it because most of them have excess capacity and they could, uh, and they've covered all of their overheads, um, so they've paid all their labour bills, they've paid all the capital, whatever. So if they can run that plant an extra shift, so if they can just change the packaging, so if you're packaging full cream milk under your brand, for the last shift of your day you change it to a Coles or a Woolworths carton, it costs you very little, um, and but you're getting a huge hit up to your bottom line because that overhead's already covered. But when it gets to 70%, um, it becomes pretty serious. And the thing about it is 
that food factories are huge, huge overhead uh, costs. So they have a sunk cost. You've got to have your labour, you've got to have your electricity, you've got to have your capital. So when it gets to the point where, it, when it's 10% of the market, a, a food company can say, I'm not interested in bidding on private label, I'm not interested, I'm going to keep going. But when it gets to 70, they can't afford not to bid because it's such a high part of the turnover. So they really have to get in there, get their volume to keep their cost down because they can't really survive. And what's happened in, in the UK and the US, uh, private label's got to 70% of the category. Private label's already at 70% of the category in milk and eggs and those sorts of things and it's quickly getting there in bread and it'll quickly ramp up in a lot of other things. So that's really going to be a, um, a, a something to really watch. As I said, private labels were slow to get traction here, but now it's starting to, to take off. It's more consistent, it's better quality product, uh, and, and, and also supermarkets are now running it like a brand. Previously, they didn't invest in the brand marketing. Now they are, and that's starting to take off. I just want to give an example of how the bottom line looks now. I want to say at the outset, this is an illustrative example. Don't take these as literal numbers, but they're sort of a typical sort of thing. So I'm not saying this is the, the breakdown of Rev versus Coles milk, I'm simply saying that these are the sort of magnitude of the numbers. If um, a private label, a, a, a proprietary brand of milk, for example, that sells for 239, the retailer is taking a margin of anywhere from 20 to 30 per cent on that. Um, but also, there's a supplier rebate. So when that supplier invoices uh, a supermarket for their product, they make a deduction, and it, it sort of varies from 10, 20, uh, from 10 to 20 per cent. But it sort of tend to be around the 17 per cent. So what that means is they they'll get uh, an allowance for early set for quick. Settlement. They're going to an allowance for uh, wasted or, um, or damaged goods. Uh, there'll be a promotional allowance. There'll be all those sorts of things, and that's about 17%. The other thing, though, is that the, the, the food processor has to spend about anything around 15% for their marketing because they've got to have a sales team, they've got to have marketing support to keep the, the brand on their shelf. So the gross return to the, to the processor when you take all those things out is $1.27. If you look at the same milk in private label, it sells for $1.80, the retailer margin is about half, and, that's, and the bottom line's not much different because all of those things that were in the middle are no longer there. So it makes it so, so what I'm really saying is that if Coles drop the price of milk by a dollar, um, that doesn't mean to say the farmer's gonna, farmer share is going to go down by a dollar or by the equivalent of a dollar, because that's not how it works. In many cases, supermarkets sell their goods at cost and make their money out of rebates. So, um, you know, supermarkets sell about 24,000 lines, and of about four or 5,000 of those, I bet you they, they're pretty close to break even, if not negative, and they make money on their rebates or cross subsidisation. <coughs> One of the big traps of private label pricing is, that, is the one of marginal pricing. When a private label dominates, the economics of marginal pricing goes out the door. By marginal pricing, what I mean is that, um, as I said before, if you've already covered your overheads, um, then anything you can get above your variable cost is bottom line profit. So what, what, when people were bidding for private label contracts, they would bid at a, at a price that would cover their variable cost plus a bit of fat for their profit and be okay. And when it was only 5 or 10% of their business, it was no problem. But when it starts to get into a situation where it gets to 30, 40, 50, then they start to have to go to full, full cost recovery businesses. And the other issue though is that because they have to bid so fiercely to keep their volume up, they've got to get, get the bottom line, you know, they've got to get their, their pencils very sharp to get that business because it's competitively bid, it's literally an auction. So they've got to bid pretty sharp. So they tend to, to get into suicidal situations that are not sustainable. And so that's where I think we've got a problem.